Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Thank you. Good morning. <laughs> uh, if you'll turn in your Bible to the book of Leviticus, that's one book past Exodus. We are going to be uh, breaking routine this morning from our normal study in Exodus. And this morning we're going to be in Leviticus, and I'll explain why in just a moment. Uh, but we'll be in Leviticus chapter 16, verses 29 to 31. Uh, the title of the sermon this morning is Denying Ourselves Through Fasting. So let me uh, read the text and pray, and then we'll jump into uh, why we're in Leviticus this morning. So Leviticus chapter 16 uh, beginning in verse uh, 29 through 31. And it shall be a statue to you forever that in the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, you shall afflict yourselves and shall do no work, either the native or the stranger who sojourns among you. For on this day shall atonement be made for you to cleanse you. You shall be clean before the Lord from all your sins. It is a Sabbath of solemn rest to you, and you shall afflict yourselves. It is a statute forever. Let's pray. <coughs> Lord, I pray now that uh, you would help us to uh, think about a topic that probably, myself included, just isn't on the forefront of our mind all that often. Um, not like food is. And so, Lord, I pray that you would help us to maybe uh, consider something or to, to think differently about this topic um, in a way that maybe we never have before. And I pray that uh, this time uh, would help us to really probe deeper in, into what it means to know you and, and what are ways that we can know you maybe unlike anything we have before. So God, please use this, uh, these next few minutes um, to accomplish that in our life. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise Night is coming up in five days, and if you're unfamiliar with what that is, it's our third annual Praise Night. We do it once a year, where we spend a night of worshiping the Lord all night long, or at least for a couple hours. And uh, the theme for this Praise Night is thirsting for God, or thirsting after God. And so to go along with this theme, we are holding a church-wide fast. Now, it's not a mandatory fast. Uh, Tim Chang is actually going to give you some more details about that later on. So I'll let him kind of explain how we're going to do that. Uh, but in lieu of holding a church-wide fast, I thought it would be befitting to change the sermon this morning to preach on the topic of fasting. Now, to start off, I want to do something quite unusual, all right? I want to make a case, playing devil's advocate, for Christians not to fast. It's no secret that fasting is, is something that we don't regularly practice, or, and if you do, please let me know. I'd love to hear about how, how that's going in your life. It's not something that I regularly practice, and I'm a pastor. Um, yes. So three reasons for not fasting. All right, here they are. Number one, fasting is only commanded one time in Scripture and never in the New Testament. The one time that it is commanded is found in our passage this morning in Leviticus. But this was celebrated on Yom Kippur, a Jewish religious day that we don't observe anymore. Furthermore, this command was given in the law, a law that we are no longer bound to in a legal sense. Jesus never once commands fasting. He never says, thou shalt fast. Neither Paul, nor James, nor John, nor Peter, nor the author of Hebrews, one time ever gives a command, thou shalt fast. Number two, after Jesus' initial 40-day fast in the desert, we never see him or his disciples fast one time in the Gospels. Actually, John's disciples come to Jesus and they ask him about this. Then, then the disciples of John came to him saying, why do we and the Pharisees fast, but you and your disciples do not? 
So it seems strange to engage in a practice that neither Jesus or his disciples regularly engaged in. And number three, fasting in some way seems ascetic. And Paul argues against asceticism. 1 Timothy 4. Now the Spirit expressly says that in later times, some will depart from the faith who forbid marriage and require abstinence from foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For everything that God created is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving, for it is made holy by the word of God and prayer. It would be very easy to say, hey, you guys can fast, but God created my dinner to be good, and I'm receiving it with thanksgiving. Colossians 2, why? As if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, according to human precepts and teaching. These have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping indulgence to the flesh. Paul says asceticism has no value in stopping indulgence of the flesh. So there you go. Three reasons for not fasting. Yes, Hong Kong Bistro, here I come. So why are we holding a fast tonight? Why are we voluntarily going without food and making ourselves hungry? Because I believe that fasting is an intimate means, perhaps unlike anything else, where we draw close to our God. So I'm going to give us eight reasons as to why I believe it is a good and God-glorifying practice to fast. And all eight of these, they're not my reasons. They come directly from Scripture, every one of them. So here we go. Number one, fasting is a means to deny ourselves. In Leviticus 16, 29, it says, you shall afflict yourselves. Now, you probably have different translations here. Uh, ESV has afflict yourselves, NASB has humble your souls, NIV has deny yourselves. Now the reason for the different translations here is the Hebrew term that is used. The Hebrew term there is ana. It's a broad term that's translated many, many different ways. It, it basically means to afflict, to humble, or to deny. Thus the three main translations. It's interesting, though, that the word ana is the exact same word that is used in Exodus 1.11, where God says, therefore they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with heavy burdens. Just as the Egyptians afflicted the Hebrews, now God tells his own people once a year on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, the most important day of the year for an Israelite, they are actually to afflict themselves. And this form of affliction was not just from food. On this day, they were up to abstain from bathing, use of oil on the body, wearing shoes, sexual intercourse, work, and food. Now, we're just going to do the food portion, all right, for our fast. I, I would recommend you bathing tomorrow for prayer group, wearing shoes, Unless God really convicts you to not take a bath, some of us are like, huh, I fast from bathing all the time. <laughs> Here's the question. Why did God have his people afflict themselves, deny themselves? God had brought them out of affliction. God had brought them out of Anna. So why was he having them return to it on Yom Kippur, the most important day of the year. Why? Three reasons. Uh, which is still part of number one. A. God wanted his people to identify with the suffering of their ancestors. God wanted to remind his people that on this day, on the Day of Atonement, that it was God who brought them out of slavery. It was God who redeemed them. It was God who atones for their sin. B, God wanted them to know what it felt like to not have every comfort and luxury in the world. Because after all, man does not live on bread alone. Man does not live on comfort and luxury alone. 
and C, because God wanted to remind them that it was He who provided them with food. It was He who gave them all th th what they needed. We don't eat because we have jobs, or we don't eat because our parents have jobs. We don't eat because we have money to go and buy groceries or go eat dim sum. That's not why we eat. We eat because there is a good and gracious God that exists in this world who is merciful enough to feed us. So why do we fast today? Even though we don't have a Day of Atonement anymore, we don't, we don't have Yom Kippur anymore. Why? Because every day is Yom Kippur. Our sin has been permanently atoned for. Why do we fast today? Because fasting today is still a means by which we can deny ourselves. Jesus said, if you want to come after me, take up your cross, deny yourself. We fast to remind ourselves, uh, even if just for one day, of the suffering of Christ. And to identify, even if just in small part, to identify with the suffering of Christ. We fast to remind ourselves that we don't live for luxury and comfort alone. To affirm that we do desire Christ more than comfort. We fast to remind ourselves that everything good that we have in our life has been given to us, not by Boeing, not by Microsoft, not by our parents, but by God. We fast to show God that we desire God. These are all gifts from God. Food is a gift from God, but we fast to show God that we desire the gift giver more than the gift. Number two, fasting is a means to confess sin. There's a pattern we see in the Old Testament where fasting accompanied confession and confession accompanied fasting. I'll give you three quick examples. Ezra, Ezra 9. And at the evening sacrifice, I rose from my fasting with my garment and my cloak torn. I fell upon my knees. I spread out my hands to the Lord, my God, saying, Oh my God, I am ashamed. And I blush to lift my face to you. My God, for our iniquities have risen, risen higher than our heads, and our guilt has mounted up to the heavens. Nehemiah, as soon as I heard these words, I sat down and I wept and mourned for days. And I continued with fasting and prayer before the God of heaven, confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which we have sinned against you. And Daniel, then I turned my face to the Lord God, seeking him by prayer and pleas for mercy with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession. Fasting is a unique time to confess our sin before God. Now we might say, do we have to fast to confess our sin? Well, no. No. You don't have to. But I want us to think of it this way, all right? Think of it this way. There has been a consistent pattern in almost seven years of marriage that Lauren will make a meal for us, a hot meal that I've been looking forward to eating. And without fail, we get into an argument right before we start to eat. <laughs> now, what would you think if you were a fly on the wall that, and let's just say I'm the bad guy, I hurt her, I offended her, she's crying on the other side of the table, and I was just eating my red beans and rice. Mmm, this is good. And she's on the other side, and she, you know, and I was like, I don't have to, we can eat and resolve this at the same time. Now, I don't do that. Why? Because I realize there's something wrong here. There's something broken here. There's something that needs to be restored here. And you know what? I'm not going to eat food right now because I need to make this right right now. So what if my food gets cold? So what if I go hungry? I love my wife more. I love the fellowship and the, the restored reconciliation more than the food right now. We fast to confess sin Confess our sin before God because we say there's something wrong right now. There's, I can't even think about food right now. I need to be right with God right now. I need to, to restore this with God. Fasting is a unique time to restore the broken fellowship with God. So 
Hear me out when I say this. Listen, if you have sin in your life that maybe you've never repented of, if you have sin that you're still wrestling with, tonight, tomorrow morning, tomorrow afternoon is an excellent time for you to go without food and to get right with God. Because it's all too easy to just eat your red beans and rice and be like, well, God will be here tomorrow. Number three, fasting is a means to humble ourselves. Two times the psalmist wrote that he humbled himself with fasting. Yet when they were ill, I put on sackcloth and I humbled myself with fasting. When I wept and humbled my soul with fasting, it became my reproach. Now, I really wrestled with this idea, with the psalmist saying that he humbled himself with fasting. Because I was like, how does fasting help us to humble ourselves? Like, how does getting hungry and going without food help us to have humility? And I was really wrestling with this. And so then what I did, which is always a good practice when you don't understand scripture, read the context of the passage. So I sat down and I read the context of both Psalms. And I noticed that the context of both Psalms are the exact same. The context is the psalmist being wronged. The context is the psalmist says, malicious witnesses have risen up against me. They repay him evil for good. The people reproached him. Drunkards write songs about him and sing down at the, the local brothel or bar, you know, making fun of the psalmist. And the psalmist is, says, in response to this, I humbled myself with fasting. Now, I realized that if I was going through this, what the psalmist was going through, if people that I cared about and I loved if they wronged me, if they repaid me evil for good, if they made fun of me, if they laughed at me, if they lied about me, what would be my response? You know what would be my response? To throw a pity party. To go home and throw a pity party. And like most parties, there would be cake at it. We have a name for this cake. You know what we call the cake? Comfort food. Comfort food. We comfort ourselves with food. I would attempt to comfort myself with food. Maybe some Netflix. Right? When we have a bad day, isn't that what we do? We comfort ourselves. Now that might be different for you. Maybe food is not what you comfort yourself with. Maybe it's programming. Maybe it's sleep. Maybe it's sports. Maybe it's sex. Maybe it's work. Maybe it's relationships. Whatever it is, we attempt to comfort ourselves. Fasting is a means by which we can remind ourselves that I can't comfort myself. How prideful of me to think that I can be the solution to my own problems. Right? That if you just eat enough creme brulee, it makes the world all better. If you just drink enough Jack Daniels, it makes the world all better. If you just slurp enough pho, it makes the world all better. If I just watch enough Netflix or program enough or sleep enough or read enough comic books, it makes the world all better. How prideful of me to think that I can heal my own wounds. So I humble myself by not running to food or whatever it is to heal my pain, but by running to God to heal my wound. It takes a level of humility to admit that I can't solve my own problems. I need something greater than ice cream or sex or relationships or video games to make myself feel better. I need my God. He is the only one who can comfort my pain. Number four, fasting is a means to create the right kind of hunger. I find it interesting that we only see Jesus fast one time, at least in the gospel. Maybe he fasted more, we don't know. But it's the very first thing that he does. The first thing that Jesus does after he gets baptized and starts his ministry is to fast. Matthew 4, then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Now, have you ever asked yourself, why did Jesus fast? Why? 
Because if someone were to ask me, Matt, give me the single greatest reason that we fast. Like, sum it up in one phrase, right? Just boil it all down, boil your sermon down to one thing. Like, what, what is it? Why do we fast? Well, I would say to create hunger for God or to teach us to hunger God more than X. Now, think about this, though. Why did Jesus fast? Jesus didn't have to create hunger for God. He had perfect hunger for God. Jesus didn't have to be taught to hunger God for God more than X because he never hungered for anything more than God. So why did he fast? This is why if somebody wants to make the argument, well, fasting is not commanded, I want to say, so what? So what? Jesus was not commanded to do this. Jesus voluntarily created human hunger in his human physical body. The text says at the end of 40 days, he was hungry. Now, I don't think that he used his supernatural ability to fast. Now, he may have used his supernatural ability to stay alive those 40 days. I say may. I'm not sure how long you can go without dying from eating. He may have used supernatural ability to stay alive for 40 days, but I don't think that he used supernatural ability to suppress the very real feelings of human hunger. I think at the end of these 40 days, he felt exactly as you and I would feel if we had literally gone 40 days without eating food. And so the devil comes to take advantage of this. The devil hits him right where it hurt most. He comes to him and he says, Jesus, you can make these stones bread. Do it. Do it. It'll taste good. You don't have to be hungry anymore. Do it. I don't know about you, but uh, I love bread. And when I'm hungry, there is nothing that smells better than warm bread baking in the house. It just fills the house, and I'm like, oh. Now imagine you haven't eaten in 40 days, and you smell that. Maybe Satan, the text doesn't say this, so this is totally my interpretation. Maybe Satan created that scent, and it's like, turn it into bread, warm pumpernickel bread. Do it. You don't have to be hungry anymore, Jesus. And Jesus looks the devil right in the eye and he says, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Now my paraphrase of that statement is, my greatest hunger, Satan, is not for bread. My greatest hunger is for my father. Fasting is a means in which we can reorient our greatest hunger from being the things of this world to God himself. Fasting helps us to create the right kind of hunger. Number five. <coughs> Fasting is a means to be seen by our Father. Jesus taught us, and when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces, that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face. See, Jesus says, take a bath. That your fasting may not be, be, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who is in secret will reward you. So much of what we do in this life whether we realize it or not, is to be seen by others. So much of what we do. One of my favorite quotes of all time, it's not a Christian quote, is uh, by a guy named Pele, who's a soccer player. I think most of you probably have heard of him before. This is what he says. Success is not how many games you win, but how hard you practice after you lose. Success is not when, when the fans are watching and everybody's cheering and everybody's awarding you and patting you on the back because you won the game. That's not success. Success is the day after you lose at 6 a.m. Where are you? Are you sleeping? Or are you on the field kicking soccer balls or shooting basketball or whatever? 
Now, let me make this spiritual, okay? Uh, who cares if you get good at soccer or basketball, all right? Let me make this spiritual. Christian growth is not ultimately determined by what everybody else sees. How good we pray, how much we attend, how well we serve, how good the lesson was, how good you walk away thinking this sermon was. That's not what Christian growth is determined by. Now, those things are important. Paul says practice these things, immerse yourself in them so that all may see your progress. The church needs to see your progress. All right, so if you're hiding your progress from us, don't. We need to see it. We need to be encouraged by it. But that is not what ultimately determines Christian growth. What determines Christian growth? Christian growth is determined by when you fail, do you go into your closet and pray? When your friends want to go out and party and you haven't spent time with God all week long, do you tell your friends, sorry, I need to go spend time with my father? That's what Christian growth is defined by. Christian growth is defined by who we are, how we think, what we think, what we feel, how we spend our time when nobody else is watching us. Nobody else sees us. Nobody is there to praise us. There's nothing glorious about fasting, period. There are no bystanders in the pantry tonight that when I walk by my pantry, somebody pops out of the door, yeah, woo, what a beast. Look at him pass up that Twinkie. Yeah! There is no praise from fasting. Fasting is just you, your empty stomach, and the one person who sees you, our Father. Jesus says, and your Father who sees you. Listen, nobody becomes famous from fasting. People might become famous from writing good sermons or starting great ministries or having great churches or writing great books. Nobody becomes famous from fasting. It is a practice that we do that is seen by only our Father. We do it for the purpose of pleasing our Father and drawing close to Him. None of us, a day from now, will like pat each other on the back and be like, man, you fasted like a beast. for our Father. We fast to be seen by our Father. Number six, fasting is a means to worship. There was a, prophet, a prophetess, Anna. She was advanced in years, having lived with her husband for seven years from when she was a virgin, and then when she was a, a widow until she was 84. She did not depart from the temple, worshiping with fasting and prayer night and day. Now, when I read this, and maybe when you read this, we might be tempted to think, whoa, I wouldn't want this kind of life right? Not departing from the temple, worshiping with fasting and prayer night and day, every day. I think most of us, including myself, would not choose this kind of life. Like, what if I asked you at the end of this service today, hey guys, I'm taking up a, a sheet, a sign-up sheet, uh, um, and if you sign up, you get to move into the church. We're going to have perpetual church services, and basically it's going to be fasting, prayer, bread. Fasting, prayer, bread. And we're just going to, like, worship and... and, and like for how long? Uh, like 2073. Any takers? Anybody want to sign up for that? Then I realized that this is only difficult if we don't enjoy the object of our worship. Worship is only difficult if we don't enjoy the object of our worship. Let me illustrate this for you. Uh, when I was a kid, I, re I remember we got our first Nintendo. I loved it. Man, Zelda is my all-time favorite game. I know some of you don't like Zelda, but I love it. All right? I started playing Nintendo, playing Zelda. Like, maybe at 4 o'clock, I got home from school. 6 o'clock rolls around. Boys, dinner is ready. No, thanks, Mom. I'm on level 2. Boys, breakfast is ready. No thanks, Mom. I'm on level eight, and I just used my blue potion, and I don't want to waste it. When we are in the presence of what we love, when we are in the presence of what delights our heart most, food takes a back seat. 
I could go days without eating to beat Zelda. Sleep takes a back seat. How many of you have stayed up all night to play video games or read or surf the web or program or read or, or to do anything? How many of you have stayed up all night and you know, like, you didn't even care about sleep? You weren't even thinking about it. You weren't even thinking about eating. You're just sitting there, yeah. When we are in the presence of what we love most, food and sleep, Take a back seat. We don't fast because we have to. We fast because we want to. We fast because we desire or we want to desire, and it's okay to say that. It's okay to say, I don't desire God that way. I don't. But then fast in hopes that you would desire God that way. We fast because we desire God or we want to desire God that way. This is why, remember in John chapter 4, when Jesus talks to the Samaritan woman at the well, his disciples go into town to buy food. They come back with the food. They're like, here, Jesus, we got your bananas. And Jesus is like, no thanks, guys. And they're like, oh, no, somebody else fed our Savior. Like, who, who could have fed him? And Jesus is like, guys, I have food that you don't know about. I already ate. What was his food? talking to the Samaritan woman, the will of his father. Jesus says, I'm, I'm full. I'm full. I don't need food. <clears throat> Number seven, fasting is a means to have laser-like focus and decision-making. In Acts chapter 13, it says, While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then, after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and they sent them off. Now consider the context of this. Barnabas and Saul are at the church. Saul is Paul, same guy. Barnabas and Saul are at the church at Antioch. They are the spiritual ones. They are like the two people that like every pastor is like, Man, if this person leaves, like this church is going to fall apart right? They are the spiritual ones. And, and I, I imagine that the church at Antioch would not have wanted to send them out. Like, don't lose your two most precious, prized people at your church. But they did send them out. Why? Because they were fat worshiping the Lord with fasting and praying. And because they were doing this, they heard the Lord say to them, while they were worshiping and fasting, the Spirit said to them, what if there are things that God would tell us, would speak to us, if we were but listening. My fear, my fear, is that sometimes we are so distracted with work and school and mealtime that we can't discern the voice of the Lord. Can we properly discern the voice of of God. And if you say, I don't know, I don't know that I've ever heard God. Some of you have told me before, I don't know that I've ever actually heard God tell me something. Have you tried fasting? Acts 14, one other example. And when they had appointed elders for them in every church with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. Now the context in Acts 14 is that Paul has just been stoned. He's just been dragged outside the city. They left him there because they thought he was dead. He wasn't dead. He gets up, he brushes himself off, and he does something that I would never think to do. He goes right back into the city that just stoned him. He actually goes back through each of the cities that he just visited. Why? It says he went back through strengthening the souls of disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, and saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. And, and what he did with each of these cities, he appointed elders in each of them. But he appointed them, they appointed them with fasting and prayer. Why? Because Paul's fate may be their fate. Hello, Bill, would you like to be an elder? Well, yes. <laughs> yeah, yes. Well, stoning may await you. Martyrdom may await you. Would you still like to be an elder? 
They, they, they appointed elders with fasting and prayer because they needed men, men who would not waver when persecution came to these churches. So they've got to get this right. Fasting is a means to have laser-like focus because they were dealing with matters of life and death. I imagine that when a brain surgeon is performing brain surgery, he's not sitting there eating a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. I imagine that when a bomb technician is disarming a bomb, he's not sipping on bubble tea. Why? Because it's a matter of life and death. There's no time for food when it's a matter of life and death. Now, you might be sitting there saying, Matt, I'm, I'm not a brain surgeon. I'm, I'm not a bomb technician. You're right. You're far more important. Your life is far more important than brain surgery and disarming bombs. Have we ever considered that the choices we make in our life may, may be a matter of life and death? And, and, and the most significant kind, not just physical life and death. So what if the brain surgeon removes the tumor? They still have to die. So what if we get saved from the bomb? We still have to die. Have we ever considered that the choices we make as Christians may be a matter of life and death, not just physical life and death, eternal life and death. Fasting is a means for us to have laser-like focus in our decision-making, decision-making that may affect the eternity of souls. Number eight, last point. Fasting is a means to devote ourselves to prayer. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 7, Do not deprive one another except perhaps by agreement for a limited time that you may devote yourselves to prayer. Now this is a different type of fasting altogether. All right? This type of fasting is actually referring to a husband and a wife who are fasting from sexual intercourse for the purpose of devoting themselves to prayer. Now, I assume that if Paul had married couples fast or suggested married couples fasting from sex for the purpose of devoting themselves to prayer, it would also be appropriate for other things such as food or whatever to fast from those things to devote ourselves to prayer. The word that Paul uses here for devote is the word scholazo. It's where we get the word scholastics. Scholastics is basically devoting ourselves to studying anything. And think about this, right? Nobody goes to their college professor when they're in college, you know, didn't turn in an assignment and was like, I'm sorry, I, I, I'm just too busy to study. Like, I, I had too much catching up on TV to do, and I, I, I was just too busy. I was too busy catching up on TV to study. Man, I, I have so much homework to get done. I, I just don't have time. Like, my, my basketball playing at Van Essel is just taking up all my time. I, I just don't have time to get my homework done. Why? Why does nobody say that? Because we're devoted to studying. We always have time for that which we're devoted to. We always have time for that which we are devoted to. Nobody can say they don't have time to pray. Nobody. Even if we honestly, even if you could concede and say, my work week, my school week was so busy that I literally did not stop. I did not have time. All, all I did was eat, sleep, and work. You know what I would say? Well, you can forego eating and pray during that time. You can forego sleeping and pray during that time. Food and sleep are our most basic need, but prayer is a most basic need, even more than food and sleep. If I don't sleep, my body will get sick and will eventually shut down. If I don't eat, my body will get sick and eventually shut down. And if I don't pray, my soul will get sick and eventually shut down. We fast to remind ourselves that as basic as food and sleep are, we need God more than these, more than food, more than sleep. Listen, I don't go one day without food. 
I'm, I, I drive home and I call Lauren like, hey, what are you making for dinner tonight? Mm hmm, that sounds good. I make sure to call her like, hey, do you have dinner ready? I don't go one day without food. I don't go one day without sleep. I make sure that I see to that. Like, I love you and you're my best friend, but if, if I'm tired, man, I, see ya. Are we devoting ourselves to God that way? Do we say, is, is, is the honesty of our heart to say, I don't want to go one day without reading God's word. I don't want to go one day without listening to him and talking to him in prayer. I don't want to go one day without my God. I need him that much. I don't do those things because I have to. I do them because I want to. Nobody forces me to eat. Nobody forces me to sleep. Nobody has to tell me that I need to do those things because I want to do them. I need them. Do I need God like that? Are we desperate for God like that? And if we're not, this is a good opportunity to create that. We fast to remind ourselves how much I need God. Don't walk out of here. Listen to me. Do not walk out of here with your head down and be like, I don't desire God like Pastor Matt said. Don't do that. Walk out of here saying, yeah, fasting. I can't wait to go without food. I am pumped to turn down the Twinkie. Because I want God. Yes, God tonight. Nothing but God tonight. Yes, yes. I am pumped to meet with God tonight and tomorrow. That is the response. As we break up in worshiping community, the question I'd like you to talk about is what do you hunger for most in your life right now? If it's God, say God. Don't be falsely humble. Say God. If it's God, say God. We need to hear that. We need to grow from your greatest hunger. If it's not God, be honest and say something else. But I want you to do something different than what we normally do. I want you to pray first. Asking God to help you correctly discern what the answer to that question is. Pray first, saying, God, please help me to discern my own heart as to what is my greatest hunger in my life. And then share with one another what that is. So let's pray. Lord, we I confess that uh, there's nobody in this room, myself included, who can say every day of their life, you are our greatest hunger. And so, Lord, we, we are devoting this fast to you tonight. We are devoting this fast to, to say, Lord, we want that to be true. We know that we cannot obtain perfection, but we are striving for it. We are striving to desire you the way your son desired you. So, Lord, we pray for your help. We pray that in the... In, in the the times before we go to bed or when we wake up and we're hungry, Lord, that we would not just think about our hunger and think about food, but think about you and think about, oh, yes, how much we need you and love you. Lord, help us in our, in our hour of need tonight and tomorrow. Help us to turn it into prayer and to turn it into humbling and to turn it into denying of ourselves and to turn it into uh, uh, joy. Lord, I pray that this fast would be rooted in joy. We would take great joy in going without food because we are already full. Yes, Lord, we are so joyful to give up something so small, to gain something so great. We, we dearly love you, God. And we thank you for dearly loving us. In Jesus' name, amen.